evening, everyone. I pray that everyone is having a good and restful day and a good day in the Lord. I want us to begin with prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day and every day. Uh, all things are uh, wonderful in your sight, and we just thank God for your love and for your mercy, the peace and kindness that you give us. Just a new day to study your word, God, and to be connected to your will. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, Deacon Janice, I started to teach on God's will today, but I felt like I needed a little bit more study okay. in that. I just did the beginning, and I, I don't want to teach anything unless I am proficient in it and really know um, the ins and outs of what I am teaching. You being a uh, professor, teacher, you know what that is like. I want us to look at John chapter 17. Uh, John chapter 17, a passage of scripture in John ch chapter 17. And I want to tag this uh, lesson, Lord, make us one. Lord, make us one. Lord, make us one. And as you turn there, I'm going to ask, we have both teachers on here. We have a number of teachers uh, watching online. Several of those watching online will be the retired teachers or worked in the school system. We sure has a great uh aggregation of teachers in the congregation. I thank God for that. I love teachers. My mom uh, was a math teacher and she retired a few years ago and she was uh, a math teacher and she taught me this lesson uh, very early. What is the distinguishing fact, the uniqueness about the number one, the number one? Lord, make us one. Lord, make us one. What is what is so special about the number one? Anything, any, any qualities about one? Anything that comes to mind? Don't I think one. unity. Unity, yeah. Being of like number. mind, working together, um, no strife, you know? Yes. It, it is the one number out of all the numbers that cannot be divided in any fashion. I, I guess if you want to get technical, you could say 0.5, but to get a whole number, it is called what a it's called a prime number. It is it is a number that cannot be divided into another whole number, uh, and so it's unique in that. Um, and God wants us uh, for the church to be one, and that that's the prayer we must pray. Lord, make us. One, Lord, make us one, make us one. Not two, not three, not four, not five. Um, why? Why should we strive for one? Why is it important to be one? What? Why, why is it important to be one? You're unified. God blesses. God blesses you when you're unified. Yeah. Yeah. God blesses when we are unified. Um, and this lesson goes for a prayer that we ought to pray for. Our families, our schools, um, for pastors, uh, something that we ought to pray out loud. And I believe as a result of it, we will feel encouraged, we'll feel empowered, uh, we'll feel moved, we'll feel blessed as a result of it. Uh, look what Jesus prays. Let's look at John 17, verse 20. John 17, verse 20. Someone could read that. John 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Uh, Jesus prays for those who haven't been converted, who haven't been convinced, who have not accepted uh, by faith Jesus Christ, and that includes us. How incredible that Jesus uh, has our attention. Uh, let's look into his prayer uh, as he uh, especially uh, calls for oneness of his people. And what's the benefit of oneness? What's the benefit of being one, being united, uh, being not able to divide? Instead of being a group of five, a group of 10, a group of 12, uh, what's the benefit for the church, for the family, uh, for uh, schools, for our community to be one? You're in agreement. Yeah, we're in agreement. We have one mind, one purpose. 
Uh, we are committed to one another. Uh, and that's what God wants us to be, is to be one. So I want We Street Prayer, everyone on this uh, uh, Bible study to pray, Lord, make us one. Why, why would Christ want us to be one? It's, it's very uh, easy. I want us to look at uh, John chapter 17. And I want us to look at verse number one. We can read that. What is it again? I missed John chapter one. But before we go there, what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus doing in John chapter 17? Does anybody know? He's talking to the disciples. Isn't this, is this the Lord's Supper or is this after? No, 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 no. It's after the Lord's right? Supper. You're, you're in that same vicinity. Uh, you're, you're near it. Is this? Lord's heaven and pray. <laughs> is this in Gethsemane? He's in Gethsemane. Okay. Yeah. So so let me, let me paint the scene. I, I, I apologize for not doing this. That Jesus has had the Last Supper. Passover meal with his disciples. Uh, and he has, Judas has gone to betray him to receive the 30 pieces of silver. And so he's been dismissed from the table. Then they do the Lord's Supper, what we did on Sunday, uh, the night in which the Lord was betrayed, took the cup and took the bread and broke the bread and uh, took the cup and drank of the cup, said, This is my body, this is my blood. And now, after that, they have gone to the Garden of Gethsemane, also called the Mount of Olives. Uh, the Mount of Olives is a uh, right outside the city walls of Jerusalem in the Kindred Valley. Uh, and it is an olive trees. And there's a presser. And it's significant that, that in order to receive the anointing, you have to be pressed. The olive has to be pressed, so you have to be crushed. This is the crushing of Jesus. Okay. And this is Thursday before his crucifixion, the day before his crucifixion. And he's on a rock. That rock is still there. I've touched the rock. Where he prays to the point that he's in agony. And what is his disciples doing? Sleep. 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 What I was doing last night at 1 a.m. Um, <laughs> they were asleep. And look what he prays. In his deepest most agonizing, terrifying moment of his life. He prays to the Father for us to be one. And we as a church, we're not to this point of crucifixion, but we ought to pray, not let it get to this agony. Lord, before I go, that's why a lot of people pray before they die, for their family, for their siblings, for their uh, children, for their husband. Lord, let us become one. We shouldn't wait to the end for us to become one. Jesus prayed. Let's look at uh, John chapter 17, verse 1. After Jesus said, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. So what, what is he praying? Who is he praying to? The Father. The Father. So we see the relationship of the son and the father. We believe as Christians, they are what? One. One. We believe they are one. Jesus looked up towards the father and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. What's the purpose of being one? It tells us that right there, to glorify God. He, he's saying, Father, let's get on the same page. Let's get on the same mind. Let, let's get on the same uh, wavelength because I'm about to go to the cross. And if we do this, we will be able to glorify God. And that's what happens when we become one. When we pray, Lord, let us be one. Why are we doing it? So we can be in agreement. So we can move together. We can be like minded. And so it can glorify God. So our worship can glorify God. Our, our, our prayers can glorify God. Everything that we do can glorify God. We can't glorify God if we are one way and the group is another way. We're divided. God is saying, let's get on. Jesus is saying, Father, 
Let's get on the same page. The time has come so that we can get on the same page. The time has come so we can glorify you. Let's keep reading. Let's read verse number two. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that you, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I so, have, okay. So, with it. yeah. So, so the purpose of us, uh, uh, you know what, read the next verse. I, I apologize. Read the next verse. This is what I want to get to. Verse four, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Hmm. Read verse five. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Look, we see the trend. They were together and they separated so that Christ can come to earth. And he's saying, now let's get back together so that we can give you the father glory. We were together before. You see that in verses one through five. We, we were together. Verse number five. And, and before and the world began, I was with you. We were giving God glory. Now we have been separated for my time here on earth. My work is done. Now let's get unified again. And that's what we ought to pray. Lord, we have done our separate lives. We've done our separate work. On Sunday, let us become one so that we can glorify the Father in heaven. Let's get on the same page. Let's not worry about worship styles, have worship wars. Let's not worry about our preferences, our perceptions, what we like, what we don't like, how we did things, how we want to do things. Instead, let's get on the same mind, the mind of Christ. Let's get, let's not worry about who's higher, who's above. Who's doing the hard work? Who? Let's get all on the same page so that we can have a purpose to glorify God. Are you with me? I'm th yeah, the word I'm thinking, I don't know, um, Deacon, uh, Deacon Janice is, is with one accord. You know, when we always yeah. say, let's, let's get with one accord. Unity. God wants unity for all of God's people to have a common relationship for us to be committed to one another, be concerned about one another, to be uh, 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 to be in harmony and believing as a community. Let's now go to John chapter 17, verse 20. Verse 20. If we can read verse 20 through 25 as a whole, and we're going to break this down together. I have one, two, three, four, four main points, really five. And we're going to break this down. Please ask questions. Those online, please ask. My, my uh, vision is not as good. So if you see a question on here or a comment, please feel free to read that. If I, if I miss it, blame it on my eyesight, not my, my lack of. Uh, it's not that I don't care. I just can't see. If someone could read John chapter 20, verse 25. 20 through 25, you said? Yes, ma'am. Okay. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. I've learned this, that Satan, dark forces, love a 
a divided family, a divided marriage, love a marriage that is two instead of one, love a family that's four or five or uh, uh, half agree with one group and half agree with another group. Uh, Satan loves a church that is six, five, two, a, a group agrees with one thing, a family agree, loves it. Because what happens is God is not glorified and souls are not saved. Jesus is praying, Lord, make those disciples one, make us all one. The disciples who are here now, uh, make me one with you and make those who are not even yet born one. First one I want to lift you is verse number 21. The model of oneness, the model of oneness, the model of oneness. Jesus gives the perfect model of unity, relationship between the father and son, father and son. One thing I can say, that I have a great relationship with my father. That's one thing. We're, we're one. We're one. We, we look, I think we look alike. We we pretty much agree. Pretty much. We don't disagree on a lot of things. A few things that we disagree on, I can't think of right now. I presently can't think of anything uh, that we disagree on. We're one because we pray for that. We've asked for that. As a result of that, God has got the glory. That when I have uh, questions about sermons or questions about church i can go to my father when my father has questions about sermons or questions about church or question about issues or, or i had questions that i can go to him and as a result of it god gets the glory and a result of it souls are saved uh jesus prays in verse number 21 let's read verse number 21 again that all of them may be one father just as you are in me and i am in you May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Yes. So, so Jesus is saying, Lord, connect all of us. We're one. We've been one since the beginning. Even though we're physically separated, we're still one. Lord, connect the disciples and those who have yet to believe, who are not even born yet. Connect Janice. Connect Minister Hill. Connect Wheat Street. Connect Joseph. Connect everyone to this perfect union connect them just like we're one he models it we as the church auto wet model unity who gonna come to our church who gonna want to join our family who won't want to marry into our family if we fussing and fighting and barking at one another talking about each other behind each other's back disagreeing who wants to join it? Who wants to join the Christian faith if we can't agree? Well, right now, that's what you have. Yeah. And as a result of it, churches are closing. As a result of it, families don't speak to each other. And as a result of it, we have chaos and confusion yeah. throughout yeah. the world. Parents ain't talking to their children. Children ain't talking to their parents. Because we're not one. We're not on one accord. We're not unified. We're not trying to get on the same communicate uh, page. We're not communicating with one another. Jesus is what praying. He's communicating. And the reason we're not is because we're not you and we're not interpreting the word of God in the same way because that's supposed to be our. When we disagree, the word of God is supposed to bring us back together, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're not communicating. Jesus is communicating with the Father in order to stay one. He's modeling it. He's mo We as We Street are to model to Auburn Avenue, to Edgewood, to William Holmes Borders. We are to model to the community, to the city of Atlanta, to the state of Georgia, to the nation, that we are one. It's not divided by families, not divided by ministries, not divided by clique, it's not divided by age, not divided by gender, not divided by uh, any other factor that we are one, yeah. just like the father and son are one. They're talking to one, they're communicating with one, they're linked, they're connected to each other's will. They know each other's will, they know each other's moves. They're held accountable for one another. They're one. Held They're one. for one another. That's deep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're equal in substance, in essence, in diverse function. They're united in purpose. 
They are united. And look, the beautiful thing about it is that God invites us into this unity. He says, have communion with us, have fellowship with me. That's why we come to the table every first Sunday. We're being invited. That's why we shouldn't miss it. That's why it's just not just some ritual that is done, that Christ is inviting us to join the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at the table. One of the greatest insults you can do is when someone invites you of great importance, a king invites you to dinner and you tell them, nah, I ain't going to show up. I'll sleep in. I ain't going to participate. Forget it. Do you think they're going to keep inviting you? It's going to be a time where they, the invitation will stop being extended. The, the beautiful thing is that Christ is inviting us to become united with the Father just like he is with the son, just like the son is with the father. How do we become united? Through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we become invited. Well, we did be taking communion more often because yeah. we're just so divided. I mean, you think when I think about that and we talk about, you know, you think about your wrongs, you you pray for forgiveness, and it gives you a clean slate again. So Yeah. And and Catholics do it every Sunday. Lutherans do it every Sunday. Rose Kennedy did it every day. To commit as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Some some do it quarterly. Uh, uh, most mainline uh, Protestant denominations do it uh, monthly, such as the uh, United Methodist AME Baptist. Um, but you can do it, and you don't you don't have to do it at church. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying become a drunk and get you, you know, but you can get you the fruit <laughs> of the vine. Yeah. And say, Lord, cleanse me. Lord, wash me. I messed up. Mm-hmm. Pray over the communion. Over the... We believe in the priesthood of all believers. We believe in the priesthood of all uh, believers. Uh, very sad. It goes for all churches. Thank you, Sister John. Man. Yes. Um, yeah, God expects unity. Among, thank you, Deacon Blake, amongst all his children. So Christ models unity. Number two, still in verse 21, the nature of oneness, the nature of oneness. God models, Jesus models unity, oneness, that you can't be divided, that you can't be separated. What would have happened if God had his agenda and Jesus said, I ain't going to follow the Father's agenda. I'm going to do I'm here on earth. He ain't around. He can't say, I'm, I'm going to do my own thing. <laughs> I don't go to the cross when I'm ready. I don't want to go pass over week. I want to go after my birthday. I want to go after my trip. <laughs> that sounds like the average person that go to church. <laughs> yeah, I ain't gonna listen to the father. I ain't gonna. He he can't tell me what to. Who he? I'm grown. I'm 33 years old. He can't tell me what to do. I left his house a long time ago. <laughs> He's like, God, you know my heart. <laughs> Salvation would not have been accomplished. We still will be under the law. We'll still be law. We'll still be sacrificing bulls and sheep and goats and doves. We'll still be trying to uh, uh, please uh, God under the law. But God said, no, this is so important. I want God to get the glory so bad. I want uh, my heavenly father to get the glory so bad that I'm going to follow his will. I'm going to connect with him. I'm going to often communicate with him. I'm going to reach out to him. And he models that by praying. He models that. He's showing us the model. Number two, the nature of one is verse number 21. The relationship between the father and the son is a model, but it is still fuzzy. What does it look like? Jesus says, even as you, father, are in me, I in you, that they may be in us. Throughout Jesus' life, his close and intimate oneness with the Father's obvious. Now he prays that we would be like he is with the Father, that is close, intimately connected. In this passage, unity refers not to being one with church members, but one with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. We are not striving to be one with our clique. I've seen churches destroyed because we are trying to be one with a group leader instead of being one with God. 
can care less if we're one if we're under God's will, uh, as long as we're under John's will. I mean, that's politics. Larry's right? will. Politics is taking over our churches. And, and, and as long as we follow what they tell, they give the marching orders. We ain't gonna read the word. We ain't gonna do nothing. We we wanna we want Peter to like us. Want Mike Mike to like us. We don't want family to get upset with us. We want to be invited to the Fourth of July barbecue. We we want to be light. We want to be popular. We want to be. Uh, we we don't want to disagree with family. We don't want to burn no bridges. Christ is saying connect with me. I'm not saying connect just with a church and try to be like the church or like a certain group or certain people. Be like Christ. Be Christ-like. Be Christ-like. When you're Christ-like, because me and the Father are one, you become God-like. And that's foreign to the world. So it's not going to fit into, you, you know, unless you're talking to people who are, like you said, of like mind and faith, it's not going to be normal. Yeah, I've learned this. It's hard to make a decision. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care if 60, 70 people don't like me. I want God to get the glory so bad. I want to be connected to Christ, his will, and to God's will that I don't care. That, that's the resolve Martin Luther King came to. That's the resolve Christ came to. That's the resolve many of us as Christians have to just come to. You know what? I may not be popular. Yeah, he took a stand for I mean, I'm not here for a popularity contest. I'm not here to be the most popular. I'm not here to be the most liked. I'm not here to be the most loved. That's cool. As long as I'm connected to his will. And how do we connect to his will? Through the Holy Spirit and faith in Jesus Christ. The whole What connects us? What binds us together? What is the glue that connects us together with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? That Christ is inviting us into this trench. It's sort of like a, a four-leaf clover. That the four-leaf clover, the th first three leaves are the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The fourth one is us. That Christ And that branch is one. That Christ is inviting us to be a part of the family of God. Isn't that good news that Christ is inviting us to be a part of his family. Romans says that we have become adopted by Christ. When we accept faith in him, we it, it, Romans goes on to say that we have become grafted. Uh, uh, Dickie Janice, you, you garden, don't you? I've heard mm, you say My you husband garden. does. Okay. I, I don't. You know, grafting, that we become grafted into the family of God. We become united. Imagine all those who are Crafted through the centuries into the family of God. They, and Jesus said that I am the branch. He is the vine. He is the vine. He is the vine. And so that we are connected, that we're one of the branches connected to the vine, to the root. And he invites us to it. And that constant invitation is given to us. But we want to be like by Pookie and Ray Ray. Why is the church not taking a stance though? Like the church is a moral conscience of society. When you say that, there, I mean, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's it's a lot. Pastors, when when yeah. things happen, why don't we go back to what the Word of God says? It doesn't mean that we yeah. beat people over the head with being dogmatic, but no one go. Very few people really yeah. want to say, "Well, the Word of God says this." Yeah, we we want to be. I think now churches are. Well, some church, I can't say y'all, that we are more concerned about Instagram likes and not being canceled more than being connected to his will, being one with the Father. We will be devastated if we didn't get the likes, if we didn't get the shares, if we didn't get the invitations, if we don't get the the um, the notoriety, and we don't want to be canceled. We don't want to be on the news. We don't want to be on a YouTube blog. We don't want to be uh, talked about. But I admire people who say, "I don't care about that. That that that, that don't matter to me." I mean, you you that, make 
You think about Dr. King when he took a stand for the yep. Vietnam War and how he literally got cut off from so many, you know, other preachers. He got scrutinized for doing that. Yeah. You, you can't be afraid to be canceled. Can't be afraid to be ridiculed, talked about. I might lose some members. I might lose, yeah, uh, uh, you know, and I understand losing members devastating and you want to save everybody. And, you know, but sometimes God has to uh, prune the plant in order for it to grow. If it means that I have a compromise to keep an influential member or keep a certain person coming in or to like me, I'm not willing to compromise. Yeah, how can you sleep at night? Like, I don't know. It's just like you sell, what is a man to gain the whole world but to, but to sell his on one and only soul? Yeah. And that's what you, I'm, we were seeing a lot of it. I hate to yeah. say it. Yeah. Yeah. Christ models one is verse number 21. Verse number 21, he shows us the nature of oneness, that he's inviting us into oneness. And verse number 21, still, we see the purpose of oneness. We see the purpose of oneness. We see the purpose of oneness. The Father and Son model close and intimate unity. But why should we model this unity ourselves? What does it accomplish? Jesus continues in his prayer, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Mm. We live ultimately and passionately connected to Christ. The world will notice. But Christ is working in us the world will see the fruit of our relationship and believe Christ is a reality. That's why we ought to strive to be one with Christ, one with the Father, through the Holy Spirit. The glue that gets us unified is the Holy Spirit. That's why we should receive the Holy Spirit, have faith in Jesus Christ, because the world may not do it. They may not agree with it, but that doesn't matter. They will see it. They will see it. Will they follow? Some will, some may not. It will have an influence on our children, our grandchildren, but they will see it. That mother was a faithful person. And I know a lot of times in my life that I saw my parents' relationship and that influenced my life. I saw that the world was doing whatever in the 80s, growing up in the 80s, early 90s. But I saw that my parents lived a different life, but still had fun, still had enjoyment still were great parents it wasn't all stuffy and boring and a drag to live that i could still have fun and be a child of god are there any examples in your life where uh you um would like to add to this or uh that there's a purpose in oneness that when when others see the church being in one the world will see. Imagine if just on Auburn Avenue, I'm just thinking Auburn Avenue, William Holmes Borders, Edgewood, and uh, streets surrounding, uh, if they saw Wheat Street so united, what that would do just on that block? I, love, I mean, when I you make me think about my first experiences at Wheat Street, it reminded me so much of my elementary school, the way that I, when I was in elementary school, um, when I was very, very young, I, they were like, it was just so family oriented. I, I felt like Wheat Street was just very family oriented. They, they People met you, you know, where you were. They were just very kind and very, you could see that it was a difference. It was like a refuge, a place of refuge for from this world, you know, all the ugliness yeah. in this world. Yeah. And people are attracted to that. People are attracted to that. That's my last, next to last point. I got one more point. That people are attracted to oneness. The purpose of oneness is so that the world can see it. And another purpose is that so people can be attracted to. People are attracted to married couples that are one, mm -hmm. that are dressed the same, walking around, holding hands. They walk, yeah, they agree. A family that's unified on the same, all on family vacation. Again. When you go on family and you see a family reunion, they all wear the same T-shirt. Say Johnson Family Reunion, <laughs> Atlanta 2022. You're attracted to that. You you say, what? 
What the Johnsons got going on? How they take over this restaurant? How they take over the mall? How they take over the Coca-Cola Museum? All these Johnsons. People are attracted to sororities and fraternities yeah. that are one. Got the same mission. Got the same goal. Given to the same uh, financially given to the same uh, purpose. People, people are not attracted to division. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know when the church is going to understand that, when they're going to get that. A lot of our issues will be solved if we became united. Are we just, is that grounded in the world? Like, if me coming out my emotions and the word of God actually ruling my life versus my emotions? Right. You, you'd be surprised of a lot of people in churches who don't own a Bible. Don't, don't own, own a Bible. Or it sits in the back of their car like a spare tire and it goes on car rides <laughs> until Sunday. Who don't pray, don't don't know how to pray. Recently, I had someone come to me, kind of shyly, who who was gr a grown, and it's nothing wrong with this. I admired them. Said, "How do I pray?" Yeah, I mean, we have to start somewhere. We all had to go there and start somewhere. I'm, I'm not condemning anyone, but some people just don't know. They weren't taught. They were not. But that's not an excuse in your 80s. A lot of times, people in church use, "I just wasn't taught," so oh. I can act the fool. I can do whatever I want. No one ever taught me. There's a time for accountability and self-examination. I hear that excuse a lot. I just never taught. Nobody ever taught me. Nobody. And so I can do whatever I want. I can act in the kind of way. I can do well. And nobody ever taught me. That's not going to be a valid excuse before the judgment throne of Christ. Ignorance to the law is not an excuse. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges that I personally see, you know, is people, affect, first of all, just agreeing that the word of God is true. And if that's the case, then I have to do some repenting, some some seriously repentance about because I know my life has not lived up to this, you know, especially if I was ignorant to it, too. You know what I mean? And I think the challenge is people we know people don't want to accept. The, you know, it's the I don't know if it's the way people are uh, interpreting scripture. I, I I don't know what the problem is, but we all are on different space. You know, we're all saying well the scripture, you know, the Old Testament. Everybody's on all all different areas, and no one's making sense, and it's confusing to people who may you know who want to who want to know the truth. The, the the biggest challenge I've had in pastoring churches. I'll tell you what it is. One of the biggest issues, I can't say the biggest, but one of it is, is the fact that people will read selectively bylaws and constitution, but will not pick up a Bible, are willing to put bylaws and constitutions of a church as the law, as their model for living selectively, not all of it, just just like Piccadilly, pick and choose what they want. This is just not one church I'm talking. This is a, I've been pastoring almost since 06. We'll pick bylaws of constitution in the place of the word as in the place of this instead of it's rightful place. They, they won't read entire bylaws and constitution because they'll see that it correlates with the word when put in practice. Most exactly. churches, they exactly. won't even read the whole thing. It's like five to six pages. They won't read that in its entirety. They definitely won't read 66 books. But they're going to read Robert's Rule of Order and tell right, you how right. And Yeah, and that, that becomes, and it's like the same issue Jesus had with the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes. That they're putting the law, man-made law, the Mosaic law, yeah, the Abrahamic law, the church law, 
over this. This is not even secondary. What's primary is bylaws, constitution, Robert rules of order, and what I think. When you discuss this, you're a villain. You're hating. I tell you, shut up. Because it, it's it, because it's it, it's it cuts like a double edged sword. It's a mirror. Shut up. Uh, we ain't gonna pay no attention to this. <laughs> shut up. And that's been an issue. When you live by this, and that's what makes the church divided. You're living off this four pieces of paper, front and back, double space, written in 1972. This is your 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 word. When God has given us a perfect word, an authoritative word, we don't believe this is the authoritative word. This is the word of God. That this is an inerrant word of God without error. God inspired. But most constitutions say that. But okay. we don't want to read that part. The beginning of it. I'm going to stay in my emotions. I'm yeah, we, we, we just want to read the part where we, most constitutions and churches always starts off the Bible's the inerrant word of God. When there's conflict, the Bible stands. That's why we're not unified. That's because we don't believe. That was, that was one of the first songs I learned, the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. I stand on the word of God, you know. Just a little we, we bit proud of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, we, my phone gets hot when it stands up for a long time. So, yeah, we, we don't want to follow this. And I believe that brings this unity within the church. We're on two different pages. There's the biblical group and there's the I just want to read four or five portions of the Constitution. Or like your dad was uh, Pastor Flippin preached Sunday, exegeting, really looking, studying, looking at the context, understanding why it was said and when it was said and what was going on. You know, we want to just make it fit fit what I think. And that's a dangerous place to be in because you can do anything and make the word of God fit it. Yeah. So it's that's really interesting that we come in. We really are in an era of time where people don't know that it's scary the word of God. Don't yeah, really second, know how to go back and look at it. Look at it. Second Timothy said, uh, Paul warns Timothy, there will be a time when people will be uh, uh, listen, want to listen to sounding brass, yeah, itching ears, yeah. and tinkling cymbals, itching yeah. ears, and uh, that they want to hear what they want to hear. And when you say, nah, but the word says, they're gonna throw it in context. Are we live in hated, you become a villain, you become rejected. But I thank God for this, and God has given me, I don't have to be invited to the barbecue, I'm cool, I can buy my own barbecue. I'm cool. People don't like me. I'm cool with that. You know, there's as many people who love me that can't stand my guts, and that's fine. You just go on with life. It don't cause me to lose any sleep. It don't cause me to toss and turn. It did at one time. It bothered me. Everybody don't like me. We not unified. I, 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 lose sleep over. I'm matured. I'm now well into my forties. That stuff don't bother me. It's not that I don't care. It's just that I'm more confident. I'm more mature in my own faith. I'm more mature in my own faith. So, 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 uh, unity, oneness is attractive. It's beautiful. Uh, how can we be assured that a close and intimate relationship with Christ will cause others to see the reality of Jesus Christ? Jesus continues. The glory, verse number 22, verse number 21, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. A basic definition of the word glory is an outward physical manifestation of God's character or invisible qualities. When we understand our position in Christ, and as we cultivate intimacy with the Father and Son, people will look at us and see God. They will see Christ. They will see Jesus. They will have a visible, tangible, observable idea of what God is like. 
So how much do people see God in us? I want to ask that question. How much does people see God in us? How, how much God do they see in us? Ask that question. You, you can answer it out loud. You can answer it over the chat. You, don't, you can't not answer it all. You can just think about it. How much do people on our job, in our family, when we're on vacation, when we're out of town, on weekend, see God in us? Even when we're communicating to fellow Christians, we're in our secular job or when we're doing church work, do people see God in us? Do people see Christ in us? When they don't see Christ in us, especially as a church, we're not an attractive church. We're not attractive. A job that people don't see Christ in is not an attractive job. A, 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 a organization, a secular a fraternity, a sorority, anything that, that people don't see Christ in, that's always divided, always arguing, always fussing, always lying, always keeping up mess, always divisive. People ain't attracted. People don't want to join that. But people are attracted to oneness. Yes. People want to be a part of oneness. Uh huh. Go ahead. I say the deception is, um, as you've already stated, because of the times we're living in, people are attracted to what make them feel make them feel valid and feel good. Yeah. And that's again, not necessarily the word of God. And I just, you yeah. know, um, yeah. yeah. I want to feel validated. I want to. I want to feel pleased. I want to feel uh, consumer driven. Churches have a lot of times become consumer driven. That we're we. The other day, I ate at Outback Steakhouse, and after I left in my email, I got a survey. Did you like it? How's everything? You know, that's good. I understand that. I understand that. But then what Outback is going to do is tailor it to my life. That's one thing Delta does. They do survey after survey after survey, and they try to tailor it, try to make everybody like it, and then it becomes a big mess. And what the world is a big mess. Yes. You can't please everybody all the time. And, and what the world needs to understand, in addition to that, is that God chastises those he loves. The chastisement, the correction, is, be, is because... It, you're, you're, we, we love you, or you know, we want you to understand. Or I want to know the truth. I want to be, you know, don't. It's not, it's not chastisement because I want to make you feel shamed or make you feel uncomfortable or embarrass you or you know what I mean, or even take away something from you. But you know, I feel like we, our job is to present the truth. Now you have to work your faith out with God in, in, in any situation. You got to walk it out, and it's a journey. We are practicing. Christianity, we're trying, but the pro like I said, it's so hard to just get to that point because the minute you know you you, you point out something in Scripture, and I'm doing it in love, not dogmatic. Don't you know it's hard sometimes to be in that space. People got to find those spaces where they can see the truth. Where I may not validate. I'm. I'm. I, what if let's just what if you know you said this. What if what if I steal? What if I'm a thief? You not. I want you to validate me being a, validate me being a murderer or whatever. No. Your job is to correct me and for and, and help me understand that God is a forgiving God and help me. And then my job is to learn the correct way. Right. And I don't see that. I see that I want them. I want it to be my way. And it's got to be this way or I'm going to or if it's not that the church is, you know, beating you with. This is what the Bible said. The Bible said, it, you know, it's, it's just a lot going on. Yeah. Let me go to the number two challenge of passion. Is exactly that. Is holding persons accountable, not because you dislike, because that that is your function as a pastor, to correct or rebuke Second Timothy. And when you do it, no matter how loving, no matter how much of a loving tone, no matter at a temperature that is small, a lot of people. Take it as not love. And Hebrews says, I wouldn't do it. If I don't love you, I wouldn't chastise you. I wouldn't discipline you. But they take it as an insult. Then they demonize you and threaten to leave. Then shame, insult, and then get a group together to agree with them. That's what I've seen a lot of churches. 
<laughs> I have admired the few people who I have held accountable. And they said, I agree. Those are one or two ever in my ministry. But the pat and while a lot of pastors don't like doing it, it's because no one else is really called to do it within the church. The deacons are called to do it, but a lot of times it falls on the shoulders of the pastor. So you do it in love, you do it, and it's I'm gonna get upset, I'm gonna get mad. And that's the same problem God had with I'm not calling anybody this Lucifer. Lucifer couldn't be held accountable. I've learned in churches accountability has become a cuss word. It's like kryptonite. Like kryptonite. And that's just not the reflection of the church, it's a reflection of life. Oh, Deacon Janice, let me ask this. When someone fails, when someone fails and you go to them uh, and uh, they're not in graduation, you've gone to them, and uh, Minister Hill, you're, you, you're in education. All those teachers on, online. They had, Johnny had done nothing all year. Won't be graduating. Has failed. Has to repeat the class. Who do the parents blame? Who is looking at you funny at graduation? Who is sitting there giving you dirty looks? The, uh, at my level, students... Parents don't get involved, but I know that's true in elementary school. Yes, yeah. The parents get blamed. I mean, the parents blame the teachers. Yeah, and, and so does the school system. <laughs> Unfortunately, we get double blame. It's 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 crazy. And, and that's the same with pastoring. A lot of times, you go to somebody in love privately. Tone is correct. Temperature. You're not angry. You're not upset. You just wanna you know, correct some things and, you know, you're just like, hey, I've been there, you know, you try to everything. And then it gets blown out of proportion. Pretty soon the whole church knows about it. But I think I beg to differ. I mean, I know you're speaking from experience, but I beg to differ because from my personal experience, when I sit down and I talk to people and I'm being transparent, people receive it. Or you, or you lead them. My thing is to lead, I, like you want them to be a thinker. I want you to figure this out. I, it ain't my job to tell you if you right or wrong. I'm showing you the scripture. You have to go wrestle with God and figure out how this applies to your life and how to work You know your salvation out. So I, I don't necessarily always see a reject, you know, people like that to me, they have their mind already made up. They're not, they're not open to receive it. So I, I have had, I have had a totally different experience in that area. Well, well I'm going to hire you. What we live in is no taking responsibility for anything you do. It's always somebody else's fault. Somebody else you're going to try to put the blame on. It's never you. Accountability. That's, that's just the society we live in. I learned, but I feel like leadership, and that's my biggest thing with leadership, especially in education, I'm going to be the first person to look at within myself to find out what I could have did, what I couldn't. You, you understand? But then there's this level of vulnerability because they rated each school. You get rated. You have it, it's, it's, you know, it's not as godly, you know, as it should be because you're when you're vulnerable, you're going to get you're going to have you're going to get scrutinized. You're going to get crucified. They're going to crucify you. I'm, I'm going to hire you, Mr. Hill, to uh, be the pastor of accountability. <laughs> that's that's not my job. That's, that's your call. Spirit. That's your call. The Holy Spirit. Well, tells you. I, I hear the Lord leading you in that direction. And, 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 you're, and Dr. Rick, Richard Flippin's uh, <laughs> sermon, if you judge yourself, then no one has the authority to judge you. So if I judge myself first, can't nobody judge me. I think, I think that's going to be your call. <laughs> in, in these last five minutes, uh, I want to just close out this. Let's thank you, Deacon um, Janice, and thank you, uh, Mr. Hill, and thank you for all those participating online. I saw uh, Deacon Blake and uh, Priscilla, and I know I may be missing some other, uh, Sister Johnny and Deborah Jones. Thank you. Uh, parents always blame the teachers and school system. Yeah. Didn't do it, didn't buy a book, didn't buy a pencil, pen. That's generational because. 
I remember when I was coming, my dad, he didn't care what the, t it, I, it was always the teacher is right and you need to be quiet. It's generation. Yeah, that was my mother. Yeah. <laughs> not nowadays. Not nowadays. Yeah, yeah I, I was ter terrified when my dad walked into Chapel Hill Elementary. <laughs> and he wasn't even there to discipline me. He'd be walking in to see the principal for some other matter. Uh, you know, something about the community or something. <laughs> but I saw him, I could smell my dad's cologne at Chapel Hill Elementary. I said, oh, God, he's here. <laughs> no, I had it worse. <laughs> my mother was a school aide in the school I went to elementary school in. I couldn't get away with No, I couldn't even get home before I was in trouble. No, no you didn't have it as bad as me. I went to Westlake High School. Guess what my mom taught at? Westlake High School. School. But you know, to bring this together, the problem is there was a time when the school system, the community, and the, and I don't want to say the government, but there was a unity going on. We were all reinforcing the same principles, the, you know, the same. Not anymore. That is, that is the, the church. That's what I'm going to say. The church, the, uh, the school, you understand? We were all one. And, and, not and, and not, that's the problem. The community, the church, the school are all now on their own page. And that is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 we, we have just a few more moments. And I want us to pray for uh, those who are uh, experiencing grief and mourning. I know the mother-in-law of um, uh, trustee uh, Kevin Jackson uh, passed, the mother-in-law. I... Um, I use my phone for this, so I'll quickly look this up on my phone, but I use it for this purpose. Um, we received a uh, realm communication about so please keep her in your prayers and that family and uh, uh, Brother Kevin Jackson, his family, his wife, uh, in your prayers. We're praying for Minister Christopher Jackson, who assembled in a car accident on last weekend. Uh, others who are experiencing grief, we're praying for Minister Hales. Uh, she's going to Ghana in just a few days and we're praying for her and we pray for her safe travels you can join us next week uh it's probably about two or three o'clock in the morning there but <laughs> you know, got some internet you might be up all right have jet lag <laughs> may have jet lag and so we're praying for you and we're praying for all those going on vacation uh just a few announcements just to be reminded of so we're all on the same page at unified we have our church meeting on july 27th the last uh wednesday of uh, the month. Sister Johnny May, on my first um, Bible study in the year, I, uh, well, one of my first sermons, I said I didn't have a calendar. And she sent me this beautiful calendar all the way from Maryland. Says Johnny May, if you're still watching, thank you for that. And so I, I have my handy dandy calendar right here. I can look to see exactly what day that is. Yes, it's <laughs> July 27th. July 27th. Thank you. Um, we will have our church meeting on Wednesday. Uh, we will have our church meeting on Wednesday, um, the 27th. Uh, we're having uh, our church anniversary, the fourth Sunday in um, July, the fourth Sunday in July. And we have invited Dr. Winfrey Martin Hope, the pastor emeritus of the Ebenezer uh, Baptist Church in Athens, Georgia. Great preacher. He's preached at Week Street, I understand. A number of times that he has um, been a blessing all my life. I've known him all of his life, his entire family. And that's on uh, July 24th. Thank you, Sister Johnny May. I saw you say, wow, I still have your calendar. And I read the card you sent along with it uh, just the other day. I was cleaning my junkie desk and I saw that card. And we're praying for your mother, uh, who's over 100 years old. Um, we have uh, church on virtual on the 24th. Second Sunday in uh, August. We're having back to school Sunday. I've invited Minister Edward Long, uh, the son of um, the late uh, Bishop Eddie Long of Newburgh, uh, Latonia. Uh, we have our back to school Sunday. And um, uh, uh, Deacon Deborah Hill, uh, Deacon Deborah Jones, I'm sorry. Um, uh, we we, we want to invite Hope Hill. We want to invite Hope Hill. I need to call you and talk to you about that. We want to invite Hope Hill. Uh, elementary and high schools, and we're going to pray for our students on that day, those who are in the Atlanta school system, the cab school system, whatever surrounding school system, pray for bus drivers, uh, those who are support teams for the school system, going back to school on that Sunday. We're going to have a back to school Sunday, and we want to get our youth involved. We want to get Hope Hill involved. We want to get all our various community involved, so I'm excited, excited 
about that. I believe that's about it. If there's any other announcements, anything, so that we can be one, so that we can be one. There's attractiveness, there's a beauty in being one. Uh, there's a purpose in being one, so God can get the glory. Um, anything you'd like to add? Thank you, uh, Deacon Janice. Thank you so much, Minister Hills. Um, thank you, all those who are watching. Is there anything you would like to add? Please let me know. And, and thank you, Deacon Jones, for being behind the scenes. And uh, uh, Deacon uh, Pitts, um, uh, 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 I can't, I, uh, this, <laughs> this one. Pitts Braun, thank you so much uh, for being behind the scenes. Sometimes when I'm teaching, sometimes when I'm preaching, I, I'll forget something <laughs> and it'll come to mind. Just the oddest things I'll forget. Uh, while I'm teaching or preaching. So thank you all so much for participating. So share this with somebody. Click share, subscribe, like, so that you will get notifications of what's going on. Love each and every one of you all. And let's uh, go to God in prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father God, we thank you. We love you. Praise God for this time of sharing. You unifying us one and you inviting us uh, into uh, your glory. God, we pray you get the glory like never before. God. We thank you for accountability. We thank you for uh, your discipline. We know it's from the Lord, God. We ask right now that you uh, bless all those who are grieving, who are hurting, uh, that you bless our church. God, unify us through your divine spirit. God, make us one, God. God, we pray right now for the ending of division, God, the ending of uh, self, God, that we will humble ourselves, crucify ourselves so that you can get the glory, God. We pray for Minister Hales as she uh, goes across the water. And God, make her a missionary, God. Uh, make her div uh, divine uh, instrument and ambassador of Christ, God. Use her, God. Let people see Christ in her, God. Let people see the love of Christ in her as she goes into the poor villages and to uh, the parts of the world that uh, need your love like never before. God, let her be the light of the world, shining light into a dark and uh, um, uh, horrible uh, at times uh, condition, God. We thank you, God, that uh, you are the light of the world. God, forgive us for all sins. God, be with um, uh, the Deacon Janice, God. Uh, be with our students as they go back to school, God. Be with our church as we unify uh, in this year, in 153rd year. God, be with the, our guest preachers from Pastor Hope. Uh, be with Edward Long and all of God's children. God, we love you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Be encouraged. Be encouraged.